Hello, my name is Trig Talley, and I'm a senior advisor to the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate and the director of the Office of Global Change at the U.S. Department of State. And I'm the U.S. national focal point to the U.N. Framework Convention on Climate Change. The United States is pleased to be taking part in the multilateral assessment. It's an important step in the valuable transparency processes. We would like to thank the expert review team for their time and thoughtful analysis during the in-country review, as well as those parties that submitted written questions on our reports during the MA process. The U.S. often stresses the importance of the reporting and review process as it is foundational to our efforts in combating climate change. We believe that the expert review, as well as the multilateral assessment dialogue, will contribute to continuous improvement in future UNFCCC reporting and support us as we strive to keep a 1.5 degree future within reach. In this presentation, we will explain the U.S. 2020 target and progress against it, showcase our domestic climate policy achievements and our ambitious long-term targets, and then finally highlight our international climate change support. Hello, my name is Karen Anderson. I'm a senior policy advisor at the White House Office of Domestic Climate Policy, which President Biden created during the first week of his presidency. Our White House team helps coordinate across agencies as the United States mobilizes the full capacity of the federal government to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Our eighth national communication and fifth biennial report shares how the United States met our emissions reduction target for 2020 and how we're building on this progress with a historic set of new climate policies to achieve our nationally determined contribution for 2030, including executive actions from across federal agencies and unprecedented investments through the Inflation Reduction Act and bipartisan infrastructure law. I'm going to briefly summarize some of these key successes, starting with achievement of our 2020 target. As part of commitments under the Copenhagen Accord, in 2010, the United States set a target of achieving economy-wide greenhouse gas emissions reductions in the range of 17% below 2005 levels in 2020. And the United States achieved and exceeded this target with net GHG emissions in 2020 that were 21.4% below 2005 levels. In our accounting, we continue to cover the full scope of emissions and removals under the UNFCCC inventory reporting guidelines. And as reflected in our report, major drivers in the achievement of our 2020 target include federal and non-federal policies that have advanced shifts toward clean electricity, greater energy efficiency, and other climate solutions across sectors. Our report also discusses how the overall energy intensity and carbon intensity of the U.S. economy are both declining, with our progress on reducing emissions happening alongside increases in U.S. population and GDP. We project that this trend is going to continue as we further reduce emissions while growing the economy. With the 2020 target behind us, our report also discusses how a wide range of U.S. policies and measures will help us achieve our targets for 2030 and beyond. In April 2021, President Biden announced the new U.S. NDC under the Paris Agreement to achieve an economy-wide target of reducing GHG emissions by 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels in 2030. The United States has also set a target and issued a long-term strategy to achieve net zero emissions no later than 2050. And these targets align with the global goal of limiting warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. To achieve these targets, under President Biden, the United States has taken a wave of new action since January 2021, starting with the president signing an executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad to mobilize the full capacity of the federal government to reduce GHG emissions while creating good paying jobs, delivering environmental justice and protecting public health. That includes the creation of our National Climate Task Force, bringing together the leaders of federal agencies to deploy a whole of government approach to combat the climate crisis. And across sectors, our report highlights our new efforts and goals, including recent actions to fast track clean energy projects and support reaching 100% carbon pollution free electricity by 2035, to strengthen vehicle emission standards and support 50% zero emission vehicle sales in 2030, to advance nature-based solutions that boost carbon sequestration and to conserve 30% of U.S. lands and waters by 2030, to advance industrial decarbonization and clean manufacturing, and to simultaneously cut emissions and energy costs for homes, businesses, and other buildings. 
We've also launched dedicated super pollutant strategies to reduce non-CO2 emissions with a U.S. methane emissions reduction action plan that includes dozens of actions across sectors in support of the Global Methane Pledge and a strategy to achieve a national phase down of hydrofluorocarbon production and consumption in line with the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. And while our report focuses on federal policies and measures, it also provides highlights of how non-federal governments, U.S. states, territories, tribal nations, local governments, are all continuing to advance ambitious climate actions across sectors, and how federal partnerships are helping them go further and faster. Our report also showcases historic new legislation that will play a major role in achieving our own NDC while also reducing the cost of clean energy technologies and other climate solutions on a global scale to help unlock additional mitigation opportunities. The bipartisan infrastructure law makes foundational investments in the U.S. clean energy economy with historic levels of support to modernize the electricity grid, build a nationwide network of electric vehicle chargers, expand public transit and passenger rail, invest in cutting edge clean energy technologies, boost climate resilience and clean up legacy pollution in communities while creating high quality jobs at the same time. And the Inflation Reduction Act builds on that foundation with tax incentives and a range of investment programs to support climate and clean energy solutions in every sector of the economy. It will help more than double U.S. deployment of solar, wind, and battery storage by 2030. It supports energy efficiency and electric appliance upgrades across homes and businesses. It provides rebates for new and used electric vehicles. And it advances cleaner industrial facilities, climate smart agriculture and forestry, and community-led environmental justice projects. And we are working every single day to maximize the benefits of this historic legislation. Because the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law were recently enacted, our report didn't fully account for the impacts on our GHG projections. However, the United States has developed a voluntary supplement to our biennial report, showing how this new legislation will help drive significantly lower U.S. emissions. The modeling in this supplement shows how with the new legislation in place, U.S. net GHG emissions are now projected to decrease to 33 to 41 percent below 2005 levels in 2030. And this represents a near doubling in emissions reductions compared to our prior policy baseline. And it puts the United States in a strong position to achieve our NDC through additional action by the federal government, non-federal governments, and the private sector and civil society. The supplement discusses these additional action pathways across sectors, including how the Inflation Reduction Act and bipartisan infrastructure law will themselves help catalyze additional federal and non-federal action by driving cost reductions across a range of clean technologies. And overall, while our eighth national communication and fifth biennial report doesn't capture every individual mitigation action underway across the United States, it does illustrate the scope and scale of our ambition under President Biden's leadership to build on the achievement of our 2020 target, to take new executive actions in every single sector, to implement our most significant climate legislation ever by far, and to continue driving additional federal and non-federal actions to achieve our 2030 NDC and get to net zero emissions no later than 2050. We know the urgency, we're going after the opportunities, and through our partnerships within the United States and around the world, we're going to keep delivering progress. Thank you. Supporting developing countries in their pursuit of ambitious climate action has also been a central feature of U.S. efforts. In 2021, the United States released its first ever International Climate Finance Plan, which lays out a whole-of-government approach for mobilizing climate finance. Uh, the plan aims to scale up international climate finance and enhance its impact, mobilize private finance internationally, and international official financing for carbon-intensive fossil fuel-based energy, make capital flows consistent with a low emissions, climate-resilient pathway, and continue to improve tracking and reporting of international climate finance. As part of these efforts, President Biden also announced he would work with Congress to scale up U.S. international climate finance to over $11 billion per year by 2024. That's a fourfold increase from the Obama administration. 
We've already made significant progress in this regard, and we're working hard with other developed countries to make sure that the collective $100 billion goal is delivered no later than this year in 2023. One of the most public faces of our international climate finance is the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID. Last year, USAID launched a bold new climate strategy to guide the agency's work through 2030. This strategy includes six high-level ambitious targets that draw on the strengths of the entire agency. They reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 6 billion tons, conserving or restoring or managing 100 million hectares, uh, supporting 500 million people in adapting to climate change, catalyzing public and private sector investments of $150 billion by 2030, and aligning USAID's broader development portfolios to support mitigation and adaptation in at least 80 countries and supporting critical populations in at least 40 countries. We're also working with key multilateral partners to tackle the climate process. We've championed efforts to evolve the multilateral development banks to better tackle global challenges like climate change. We've advocated for the MDBs to include hurricane clauses in their lending agreements, freeing up critical fiscal space when disasters strike. And we have supported efforts for the MDBs to move beyond GDP and to better account for vulnerability in their work. And we've stepped up our engagement with critical multilateral funds. In 2023, the U.S. served as the co-chair of the Green Climate Fund Board, where we advocated for ambitious strategic plan for the fund's replenishment and pushed for steps to access to finance. We supported the expansion of the GCF simplified approval process to larger low-risk projects, a new accreditation strategy and framework, and a significant scale-up in resources for readiness under GCF too. We also provided $1 billion to GCF this year, supporting the fund's efforts to pursue impactful programming, and we've provided the first $25 million tranche towards fulfilling President Biden's $100 million pledge to the Adaptation Fund. The United States is stepping up, supporting our partners, and delivering results. Beyond finance, the U.S. has been deeply engaged in efforts to promote climate-related technology development and transfer, as well as capacity building through bilateral and multilateral foreign assistance. The United States continues to play a leading role in the UNFCCC technology mechanism composed of the tech and the climate technology center and network. We've helped maximize the impact of the tech and the CTCN by coordinating their work through the joint work program of the UN Framework Convention's technology mechanism for 2023 and 2027. And we include support for capacity building throughout all U.S. support activities, not as a separate line item or project, but embedded throughout everything. Capacity building is at the intersection of climate change and development. Delivering on both simultaneously is crucial to project sustainability and results. U.S. capacity building support is based on country-owned plans and strategies with a long-term view toward economic prosperity, inclusion of historically marginalized and underprivileged populations, and environmental sustainability. Even if all nations announced mitigation pledges with emissions peaking in the mid-2020s, climate change will still impact many facets of human life in every sector of society. That's why in November 2021, President Biden announced the President's Emergency Plan for Adaptation and Resilience, or PREPARE, along with a commitment to work with Congress to fund PREPARE at $3 billion annually by 2024, representing a six-fold increase from previous U.S. funding levels for climate adaptation. PREPARE draws on diplomatic, development, and technical expertise in the 19 U.S. government departments and agencies involved in our effort. It focuses on three pillars, climate information, adaptation, integration, and resource mobilization. The first pillar is supporting early warning for all. 
We're supporting the UN Secretary General's early warning for all to help close the early warning gap globally. In 2023, under PREPARE, the Famine Early Warning Systems Network, or FUSENET, a long-standing USG program, incorporated early warning and risk assessments for health threats posed by climate change for the first time. Under Pillar 2, we're supporting capacity building efforts to mainstream adaptation into policies, programs, and budgets, and to support locally-led adaptation, focusing on the impacts of climate change on food security, water, health, and infrastructure. We're supporting the Least Developed Countries Initiatives for Effective Adaptation and Resilience, or LIFE AR, an LDC-led initiative to achieve a low-carbon, climate-resistant future by focusing on locally-led adaptation efforts. Through LIFE AR, LDCs are integrating adaptation into national and local development objectives. Finally, Pillar 3 accelerates financing for adaptation by enhancing engagement with multilateral funds, improving access to finance for adaptation, developing bankable investments, and mobilizing private sector capital. One example is the Food Security Accelerator launched with the Africa Adaptation Initiative at COP27. This program is developing a pipeline of transformative adaptation investments across Africa, ranging from cold storage logistics to climate resilient crops like Fonio. It's structured to build private sector capacity and crowd in private capital. We expect that the $45 million we provided for the accelerator will bring in three to four times that amount in funding as the accelerator becomes operational, yielding significant benefits for the climate resilient food security of local communities. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the United States Multilateral Assessment in Dubai in December.